to you. Very fascinating stuff. Um, we're going to go into the... Uh, no, some people think that because you have in Parsha's Truma, um, if people think that once we're, we're going to get into the description of the, of the Mishkan and its uh, various uh, the utensils, so what can, what, what can be there? Right, but we'll see that there's a lot more, a lot more there than anybody could imagine. Um, so first of all, in Pasuk Ches, the bottom of page 444, um, the bottom of page 444. So it says, "The Asuli Mikdash, v'Shachanti b'Socham." They should make a Mikdash for me, and I will dwell among them. Now. Uh, the commentaries point out over here that um, A, we were talking about a Mishkan. The Mishkan is in the desert. It's the tabernacle. The Mikdash is the base of Mikdash. So there is the ultimate command, which is going to be the base of, make, make a base of Mikdash, and that's going to be made out of stone. The Mishkan, which is the tabernacle, is a tent. It's made out of, what do you call it? Because obviously if you're in the desert and you're moving from place to place, you're not going to make a stone building that you're going to move around with you. So they're going to make a Mishkan. But there's more to it. The, you see, Mishkan, means, Mishkan literally means the dwelling place. So that's, that's the literal, literal translation. Torah, anytime people were in Parsha's uh, Truma, page, Perichav, hey, Pasuk, uh, Pasuk Ches. So uh, the Mishkan is the tabernacle. Then there's going to be the ultimate command to make a base of English. But more than that, there's a difference in the level between the Mishkan and the Beis HaMikdash. Why is one called the, the, the which sounds holier? Beis HaMikdash. Beis HaMikdash, it says Kadosh, right? Sounds, certainly sounds holier. So that's ironic, because the Mishkan, they were in the desert, they had spiritual food, right? They had the man falling from heaven. They, uh, uh, they had spiritual water. If you drank the water from the well of Miriam, it, uh, it, it also had an effect that made you more, reci- more it made you more uh, recipient to Ruchnius, to spirituality. And uh, they could sit all day and learn. They didn't have to work. You didn't have to work where you didn't have to work. The man fell. You know, they didn't have to work. You had a daven. You didn't have to work. Yet in Eretz Yisrael, once they go into Eretz Yisrael, then you're out. People are working in their fields and people are planting and people are involved in commerce and in real estate and in the agriculture and everything else. Yet it's called a Beis Amigdash. So uh, the Mephorshim explained, yeah, because that's a higher level. When you've got everything laid out for you, right? You, uh, you, you know, you got blatant siyata de shemaya, because Rochus is just 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 laying out, rolling out the red carpet for you. So that doesn't take much. All you got to do is sit and just do the job. In the in in in, in to, to to go and live in two worlds at one time, you're in the physical world and you're staying ruchli. That's a much bigger challenge. That's a much bigger challenge, which is one of the reasons I personally find Yom Kippur is an easier day for me than Rosh Hashanah. Doesn't mean it's fun. I didn't say it's a funner day. Uh, you know, fasting is a drag. But uh, you know, fasting. You know, you, you know, get a little headache and that sort of thing. But it's definitely an easier day to be spiritual because I'm completely detached from anything physical. Rosh Hashanah is that door open? One of the doors open. Yeah, close that door over there. Okay. Yeah, please. Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. You go to shul. You dive it intensely. Then you come home and you eat. You're back in the physical world. Back in the physical world, when you're married and you have kids, then you're not only in the physical world, you're in the circus. Right? Where, 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 whereas you have Kipper, I'm basically out of the house morning till night. Leave my wife to the circus. Right? So that becomes, I find that that's a much more difficult to, because you're, in Yiddish they say, tansing, you dance at two chasnas at the same time. There's an expression, you can't dance at two chasnas at the same time. Right? Here, I got to balance both. I got to go to shul, be very intense, and come home and watch kids fight over who got more grape juice. Right at the Shabbos table, which is why, by the way, I always advise parents, when you're making a fight, have you ever seen that kind of fight? Yeah. He got more, he got more? Have you, sorry, have you ever not seen that fight? Yeah. So, so I always advise parents, before you even make Kiddush, pour grape juice in the kids' glasses. It's a, a simple solution that calms everybody down. They've already got their grape juice. They've already got their grape juice. Now I can make Kiddush quietly. Except then they start fighting over who gets to drink from my cup too. Mm. Right? So, that, so at least you, you cut out some of the fight. That's one of the reasons why women are given the assignment of being the physical woman in the house. The wife is in charge of the kashras, 
The wife is in charge of the material, raising the kids. She's not as, what are men doing? Men are supposed to be learning, is that every free moment you're supposed to be learning. Because a man, it's difficult for a man to be involved in the physical world without that constant reinforcement of ruchnius that he needs. A woman has more capability of being in the physical world and not losing her, 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 her level. That's why the women are assigned, why the women are assigned the physical aspect of life. So the men, you're supposed to be put on some tefillin and put on tzitzis and put on, learn some Torah and go to Ma, Davin and Aminia. We need all the help we can get. Because for us to be involved in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, the, 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 the physical world, the material world, that brings us down, could bring us down very quickly. Therefore, if you're in that world and you maintain a higher level, that's even the higher level. That's the base of Midash. When you go into Eretz Yisrael, that's the real Avodah Hashem. The highest challenge of Avodah Hashem is to be in Eretz Yisrael without the mud falling down and without the water coming up from a, a, a mis, a, some, some sort of spiritual spring and then maintain your devotion. That becomes, that's why it's called the base of Eidash. Yeah, question. I just wonder, is that why women are not um, called to mitzvahs? Well? No, the time-bound mitzvahs, uh, the reason women are not, are not obligated uh, on the time-bound mitzvahs is because her role, by definition, can't be bound by time. If a woman has given birth and the baby needs to nurse, she can't say to him, okay, listen, Stanley, just wait, because i got to catch some on Kriyashma over here. You know, a baby's crying and screaming, and a baby has to be, what do you call it? And not only that, a woman is exempt from the mitzvahs if she's taking care of her children. She doesn't even have to daven if she's taking care of her children, because ha'oseik b'mitzvah, potter mina mitzvah. Somebody who's dealing with a mitzvah is potter from another mitzvah. Your child is a mitzvah. Maybe we could turn off one of the things, by the way. The uh, potter. Thank you, thank you, man. potter mina mitzvah. If you're dealing with a mitzvah, your children are a mitzvah. Your children are a mitzvah. Believe it or not, to feed your child, to feed a dog who's hungry, that you'd agree is a mitzvah, right? They, they, so, so the feed of a, a two-month-old baby is also probably a mitzvah, right? And be a way to go, baby. Hey, fend for yourself, kid. No, it doesn't work that way. Kid, that's also a mitzvah. So, so, so that's that's idea number one. Idea number two. The commentaries point out the asuli mikdash shachanti v'socham. The people are going to build a Mishkan. Uh, when was it that they went to architectural school? When did they go to architectural school to learn how to do this? They were building the cities of Pito and Oh, I see, I see. Because building those pyramids involved all sorts of articulate, all sorts of intricate weaving and dealing with, with gold and everything else. I, I think not. They were, they were being whipped and moving heavy bricks right, and putting them in place. That I could do. Right, where they got to start weaving and making curtains that have an image on one side and another image on the other side without any sign coming through that there's an image on both sides. Where did they learn all this? The answer is, I will dwell in their midst. That means they make the effort, and of course, Baruch says, I will bless them. The architect, the main architect of the Mishkan was a man named Bitzalel. We'll find out later. How old was he when he took on this project? 13. Bitzalel was 13 years old. Right, when he took on it, where did B'tzal learn it? Isha Asher Ruach Bo. He has, he has the Spirit of God in him. It was something that they did spontaneously. Anybody who devoted themselves to the job, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave them the ability, he gave them the ability to do it. Okay, now, let's go on to the utensil. This is fascinating. The first utensil that we find is on 446. The Asu Aron Atzei Shitim. They should make an Aron out of Shitim wood. According to some, they brought wood with them, and according to others... Uh, they were there were forests where they were passing through in the desert that had shittim wood trees growing there. Different opinions. One opinion is that they brought the shittim wood with them out of Egypt because they knew that there was going to be building a, a mishkan, and they build this aron. Now look at the uh, first thing of the aron kodesh is look at the dimensions. Ama sayim v'chetzi orko, two and a half amas long. The ama v'chetzi rochbo, an ama and a half wide. The ama v'chetzi kamosa and an ama and a half high. It's two and a half by one and a half by one and a half. Okay, let's say this table is the, the dimensions of the earth. Okay, it's two and a half amas long, one and a half amas high, and then one and a half amas high. Now, the first thing is there's a misconception because the Aron Kodesh, when you think of it, what color was the Aron Kodesh? Gold. Gold. Okay, that's a mistake. Because the Aron Kodesh, it says make it out of wood. Make the, Aron the Aron is the middle. Now, what the Aron Kodesh looked like, the Torah is going to say, in the very next passage, it says, Vitzi Pisa Osazav Torah. Coat it with gold. Now, that sounds like you're going to paint it with gold, right? That's not true. That's not correct. There were three boxes. 
There was the middle box, which is the Yoron Kodesh, which is made out of Atzei Shittim. I think, how does he translate? Acacia wood? It's out of Acacia wood. That's the Yoron Kodesh. There's an inner box, which is made out of gold. And there's an eye. You ever see these kids' blocks when one block fits into another block, the, the series of blocks? That's what it looked like. It was three boxes. The outer box is pure gold. The inner box is pure gold. And the middle box is wood. That's the Yoron. The coating... In this particular case, the coating is not a coating that's painted on. The coating is three separate boxes. The inner box is the inner coating. The outer box is the outer coating. And then it's covered with the kaporis, which is pure gold. And the kaporis has the kruvim sticking out of it. There's a, there you have the, uh, the cherubim, uh, uh, the picture of the cherubim sticking out. They are, part, they are actually made out of one block of gold. Now we're talking about massive amounts of gold over here. I once made a calculation uh, based on my, uh, the, the, the kaporis is one tefach thick. So I'd say it's four inches thick. So imagine this tabletop, this tabletop, which is about, an ama is about, uh, an ama is about 18 inches. So two and a half amas uh, by, by minimum standards, by minimum 18 inches, two and a half amas would come out to 36, 47 inches. So this is, let's say it's 47 inches and it's an arm and a half wide, about this tabletop, something like that. Now, I picture this tabletop being this thick and pure gold. So I once made a calculation, I don't remember, based on the price of gold at the time and how much I estimated it to be. The tabletop alone, tabletop alone, besides the weight, well, the weight which is ridiculous, the tabletop alone came out based on the price of gold to about $10 million of gold. I mean, can you imagine this thing this thick in pure gold? And it came out, my calculation was about 10 million, certainly millions of dollars. So the first thing is they get this picture of the Orem Kodesh that it's coated with gold. Now, the first thing that stands out here is the dimensions. The only time we find in any of the utensils in the base of Migdash, fractional dimensions is by the Orem Kodesh, number one. And the only other time you're going to find is if you look on the next page, on page 448. <clears throat> Make a shulchan out of shiti wood. It's on page 448, about seven lines from the bottom. Amasayim orko, two amas long. The ama rochwa, one ama wide. The ama vachetzi kobaso, an ama and a half high. That's the last time you're going to see fractions since uh what was the seventh grade right but the last time you're going to see fractions in this puzzle in this in this uh in this what do you call this parsha is by the height dimension of the table so there are only four fractions that you're going to find anywhere in the utensils here three of them are by the Aron kodesh and one of them is the height dimension of the shulchan of the table where they put the showbread on it what do you think the significance is what went into the Aron Kodesh? The Torah. the Torah and the Luchos. The Aron Kodesh is a symbol of the Aron Kodesh is a symbol of Torah. The Shulchan, which had the breads on it, twelve breads, not coincidentally, is the symbol of prosperity, of kingdom, Malchus, prosperity. And the Mizbeach, the altar, is a symbol of Kahuna. Now, the Kohanes. When you have the shulchan, you also have the menorah, which, by the way, is symbolic of what? Torah. Menorah is also Torah, the light of Torah. And then we're going to have to reconcile why it is you have two utensils that rep represent Torah. I'll tell you an amazing shot that, uh, that, that I heard, and I'll tell you who said it afterwards. You'll see it's even more amazing. The, the first idea is that Torah could be learned bikiyas, right? Length and breadth, right? The breadth of Torah, just encyclopedic knowledge. And there's also the depth of Torah. You can continually go, there's more, always more information, and there's always more depth. And therefore, the Torah is telling you right here that when it comes to learning Torah, you always see yourself as complete, incomplete. We're a fraction. There's always more to go when it comes to Torah. When it comes to Torah, there's always more to, you know, if you learn Baba Kama, you learn a few lines, I know all about it. Right? Yeah. 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 What about Tosos? Right? Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Uh huh. Then you find out that it's all it's all of a sudden you know the in, incomparable depth. There's constant depth. Rav Moshe Feinstein said once. Rav Moshe Feinstein says, the more Torah you know, the more you realize how deep it is. And it's a very good, that's why it's called the Sea of Learning, the Sea of the, the Yam HaTalmud, the Sea of the Talmud. When you go into the ocean, who knows about wh- how vast the ocean is? Huh? The, the deeper you go into the ocean, the more vast the, 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 the more you know how vast the ocean is. When you're on the surface, yeah, wow. Well, I, was, I was in a car once driving from, from Los Angeles to San Diego. We're right on the coast of the Pacific. And I'm looking at it and thinking, wow, that's pretty big. Yeah, wow, that's pretty big. I had a beautiful view of the Pacific. Not that I cared about it. I was eating pistachio nuts at the time. I cared much more about that. <laughs> and, I, and I took a look. Okay, there's the sea. I'm not in it anyway, you know, but it's, it's pretty big. So you go in. Then you start looking down and what, 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 what's can tell what kind of fish or what kind of creatures. I think they've, they, they claim that they've only discovered, they only know about like 5% of what goes down on, what goes on in the, on the ocean. Huh? Probably less. And they're constantly discovering new species of fish and new creatures of this. I think in the Amazon forest, in the Amazon rainforest, which is on land, they're constantly descri- uh, discovering new species, right? New species, new civilizations, new everything. So you know very little. In Torah, fractions. What about the Shulchan? What about prosperity? When it comes to prosperity, there's length and there's width. By the Shulchan, by the showbread, which is prosperity, the length is two, the width is one. The height is one and a half. What do you think that symbolizes? What do you think that symbolizes? Length and width by the Shulchan represents our existence in this world. When it comes to our material possessions, we should see ourselves as complete. Right? The wealthy man is the one who's happy with what he's got. I don't need more. How much do you really need? How much do you really need? Right? Length and width. When it comes to the height dimension, which refers to spending our money on ruchni pursuits, like tzedakah and tefillin and the lulav, there we should see ourselves as incomplete. There's always more that we could do in the spiritual dimension with our resources. As opposed to the opposite. Most people see themselves as, well, I'm a pretty good person. You know, spiritually, I'm, I'm basically, you know, there's me and 35 other tzaddikim of the generation. You know, when it comes to the material, we're always looking to increase our material. We're always looking to increase our material. The Torah is exactly the opposite. When it comes to our spiritual pursuits, when it comes to the Torah, a person should see himself as being incomplete. And when it comes to the physical pursuits, you should see yourself as being complete, except in those areas where you should be spending your money on ruchnias. There, you should always feel, I could use my material resources for more. I could invite more guests into my home. I could use my money for tzedakah. I could build, help build a shul. Whatever it is that you use your money for. That's what's alluded to first before anything. Number one. Number two, you'll notice that it says at the top of 446, the osu aron, they should make. It says it in the plural. They should make. And when the 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 the, the, the Aron Kodesh. And when it says by the Shulchan on page 448, it says the Asisa in the singular. You should make a table in the singular. Whereas over here it says the Asu in the plural. Anybody care to venture a guess why there's a difference? Nothing, Jake. Plural by the Aron Kodesh, singular by the Shulchan. Wasn't there more than one like, wasn't there like the six hundred thirteen commandments and all that? Yeah, but uh, the, 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 that goes into the Aron Kodesh. What the, the description of the Aron Kodesh? What's that? By what? By which one? No, the also is by the Aron Kodesh. Oh, by the Aron Kodesh. The and plural... They to make their own as well, in addition to the general. Okay, okay. There is, there is that concept where it says, V'asu li mikdash v'ashachanti b'socham on the previous page. That's also in the plural. They shall make for me a mikdash, and I dwell in their midst. The commentary say every everybody should turn himself into a miniature base of mikdash. And you have the Shekhinah dwell in our midst. That we have to perfect ourselves, get to the point where the Shekhinah dwells within us. That is true. Here, one of the Forshim says, V'osu, 
How do you learn Torah? You learn Torah in a group, at least two people. At least two people together. You learn with the Chavrusa. And the reason you learn with the Chavrusa, the reason there is the concept of Chavrusa learning, is because when you're learning with the Chavrusa, you're going to say something, and if you step out of line, he's going to shave you down. And if he says something incorrect, you're going to shave him down. You're going to, you're going to debate it till you both arrive at the truth. Torah is arrived through bouncing your ideas off. So when you learn by yourself, you'll always find that the next day when you start hearing it in sheer, like, boy, oh boy, oh boy, I miss that. I miss that, right? And that happens, I can tell you, that happens to me. When I prepare this year, then I go in this year and give the sheer to guys who are, uh, who, who have not had a lot of Gemara experience. All of a sudden, I find out that I missed a whole bunch of stuff. Because Torah is learned in a group. That's one of the reasons yeah, you learn in a base way. I mean, have you ever been in a library? The university library. Right? You could hear you could hear a yeah, you could hear a pin drop, or maybe more you could hear a joint drop, right? In the library, I maybe mean, that's more accurate, right? You could you could hear somebody snorting cocaine, right? In the base in the base medrash, <laughs> you could hear a snort. In the base medrash, you walk into the base medrash, and the places the places people look like they want to kill each other. You know, people are yelling, and it gets to the point you can't, I can't even learn in a quiet room. I need background noise, but only base medrash background noise. Not my daughters chatting in the background. I need that base medrash background noise. Because Torah is acquired in Chabura. Torah is acquired in a group. The Asu Aron. Asu, plural. Torah, you need a group. You're not a lone ranger. There are few individuals who are lone rangers, like Rebel Yashiv Zatzal, who learned by himself for the most part. Once in a while, you get that outstanding individual, or of Chaim Kedievsky, that... But for the regular average person, we need to be in a base measure. We need to be in a group. You need to be part of a chavrusa. You go to a dafyomi shir, and you go to a shir, and you learn with a chavrusa, and you discuss it with your friends, and you debate it with each other. If you've ever been to kolol, even in a more advanced situation, part of learning in a kolol is two guys get stuck and then go over to another pair of chavrusas, and they start fighting with each other about it until they finally get the shot. Torah is acquired in a group. What about material? The asisa shulchan. You're on your own when it comes to the material. When it comes to the material world, keep your eyes on your own plate. It's a difference if the next guy upgraded his car. Right? As soon as one guy in the block upgrades a car, within the year, most of the block will upgrade their car. As soon as one guy does repairs, one guy upgrades the steps going up to his house, they put up new railings on the steps, everybody on the block eventually the next door neighbor is going to see it and then somebody sees the two and then it's for true or not true everybody upgrades the Torah is saying that's not the pride that's not the approach the approach is keep your eyes on your own but what's the difference with what everybody else has don't worry about anybody else when it comes to the material when it comes to Torah then it's the asu it's in plural more um, the broken dimensions by Torah represent that a Torah learner has to be humble. Now, the truth is, by, by material, certainly you have to be humble. But uh, by the Torah, the commentaries say, a person has to be humble. No matter how much Torah you've learned, you know there Moshe Feinstein, who knew the entire Torah, everything there is to know he knew, right? And Moshe Feinstein himself felt that he's missing, Right, so all the more so, those of us who have learned a little less Torah than Rav Moshe Feinstein and Rav Yashiv, all these people, Torah requires humility. Right? Remember we spoke yesterday at Rav Lezer Godel with the water flowing, which is a sign of humility. And if you don't have humility, just learn a little bit more Torah. It's, it's very humbling. <laughs> There's nothing as humbling as Torah. You, know, you get these people who have mastered, they got their degrees and they've been great in college, then they hit, they hit a Gemara. That's a great equalizer. Right? Or as Rabbi Victor Miller once said, you know, you start learning Gemara, it's hard. Then you get pretty good at Gemara. With Rashi, Rashi's hard. But then you're okay with Rashi. Then you get to Tosas and Tosas. No, Tosas is always hard. That's what, that's what Rabbi Victor Miller said. Tosas is always hard. If, you're, if, you, ever, if you ever think really high, high, highly of ourselves, sit down and learn a Tosas. That's, that's very humbling. Right? So Tosas, Gemara, Torah requires a certain amount of humility. Ramosha Feinstein had a woman once calls up. It was in his later years. And she says, uh, can I speak to Rabbi Feinstein? In his later years, originally, Ramosha would answer the phone himself, even when he was in the base medrash. He had his own yeshiva in the, in the Lower East Side of New York, and he had a telephone with him in the base medrash. 
so that if people could call him, so he was accessible all the time. He absolutely accessible. As he got older and he was a little more frail, so they had people screening the calls. So this woman calls on an Arab Shabbos. She says, um, hi, can I speak to Rabbi Feinstein? So the guy says, the answer is, he says, uh, well, maybe I can, you know, what would you like to answer? What would you like to ask him? Uh, she goes, I'd like to know what time is uh, candle lighting today? Erev Shabbos, what time is luch benching? He says, you know, uh, there are calendars available. I don't know that this is the type of question that you really have to, there are other people you could ask about what time luch benching is. Or what finds, you know. She goes, well, what's the problem? I've been calling him every Friday for the last 20 years. What's the problem? Nobody knew. Couldn't tell anybody. You know, she called. She needed him. She answered the phone. This is the same man who's answering questions about how to separate Siamese twins or how to separate who are sharing one heart. How'd you like to handle that one? Yeah. Yo, know, you thought the rabbis are talking about spoons and pots all the time, huh? And people who forgot Yala the Yovo, right? How, how, how'd you like to answer that one? You know, oh, Siamese twins joined it, co joined at a heart. How do you separate the surgery? How about that for a question? Or a man who's disappeared in the Twin Tower, in, in what do you call it? His plane crashed in the in the deserts of Arizona and the body hasn't been found. Is the wife an Aguna or not? How do you like to answer those types of questions? Which came to Ramosha and said, no, you thought, oh, I forgot Yellow Viova my third time through Shmon Esrei. Right. Do, I, do I have to repeat it a fourth time? It's almost mincha time already. <laughs> Guy's happening all morning. Yeah, You thought that's, a, thought that's what they're answering. Huh? No, 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 no. It gets rough in the trenches. So, 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 Ramosha finds that that's the humility. Oh, she woman's calling. She needs, she needs a wedding call. She needs a, she needs a, 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 a wedding call. She needs somebody to answer what time is Luch Menchik. Okay, another idea. Why are there two symbols of Torah? Why do you have the Ur Kodesh? And later on, you have the menorah. And the menorah obviously represents the Ur Kodesh. The menorah had seven branches. And the seven branches of the menorah represent seven branches of wisdom. And there are two, what do you call this? There are two symbols of Torah. What's the, what do you think is, is the most basic idea? Considering especially that the Aron Kodesh had inside it, it had the luchos, the tablets. There's another opinion, it had a Torah scroll in it. And it had the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the... Uh, um, the broken tablets in it, and uh, it had the, even the shiver, the ones that he broke the first time were put in your own codex. There's an opinion that there was a Torah scroll in there. There's even an opinion that there was a, a, a shelf, that the man, there was a container of man next to, next to it. Isn't that interesting? What do you think the container of man is representative of? You learn Torah, you'll be supported. Don't worry about it. Uh, Kosh Rochu could provide. There's no shortage. Kosh Rochu is loaded, as the old saying goes. Okay? Now, what are the symbol of the Aron Kodesh, the, the menorah and the, the menorah and the, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the Aron Kodesh? So first, the obvious answer is that the Aron Kodesh represents Torah Shebiksav, the written Torah. The menorah, which they kindle, and there's a light burning, is Torah Shebaal Pet, which obviously shows you the difference. What's the difference between Torah Shebiksav and Torah Shebaal Pet? Torah Shebiksav, the written Torah, the blue book, where was it? In the Holy of Holies, which was inaccessible to anybody except whom? How often? One day a year. One day a year, the Quran goes into the Holy of Holies. Where was the menorah? The menorah is the outside area. It was only accessible to the Kohanim. But how did it get lit? You had, human, you had a human contribution to lighting it. Isn't that what we do with Torah Shebiksav, with Torah Shebaal Peh? There's no innovation in Torah Shebiksav. In the written Torah, there's nothing to innovate. This is it. You can't change it. You can't change one letter. You can't change one yud. No innovation. There's no human touch in Torah Shebiksav other than to study it. In Torah Shebaal Peh, that involves our own innovation, what we call Chiddush, what we call novel ideas, as long as they obey the laws of the Torah. So this Aron Kodesh represents the written Torah. The menorah represents Torah Shebaal Peh. And that's why the menorah is the miracle of Hanukkah. What was under threat at the time of Hanukkah? It was the oral Torah that was being threatened, not the written Torah. The oral, everybody believed in the written Torah. 
the oral Torah was under threat, and therefore Hanukkah is the rekindling of the of the menorah in the in the base of That's 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 the basic idea. Now, there's another idea. As I found, I am enchanted by this, and I'm particularly enchanted by the person who said it. There are two aspects to every Talmud Chacham. A Talmud Chacham has to be, number one, he has to be in a base medrash, hidden away from the public. You're in the base medrash, but your involvement is Torah. You're not involved with everybody around you. You're in the base medrash learning. The other aspect of the Talmud Chacham is that he becomes an influence on his surroundings. The Aron Kodesh represents that the Talmud Chacham is in the base medrash sitting and learning. And the menorah, the light of the menorah represents that he also has a role to play in the community, that he exerts an influence and he sheds a light on the community. What's remarkable, gentlemen, if you stop and think about it, let's take Rabbi Chaim Kineski just in this example. Chaim Kineski has never occupied a official position, do you know that? He does not have a position. He's not a rav of a community. He's not the rav of a shul. His father, the stipler, told him, you will ne you never take a position. So he never took a position. Whatever the stipler said, Ruchaim Kineski carried out to the letter. Ruchaim Kineski was once, the stipler was once waiting for him. He was supposed to come to his house. Ruchaim was supposed to come to his house. They used to learn together when the stipler and the older they, and Ruchaim wasn't there. And Ruchaim didn't show up. He never came late. The stipler wasn't there. So the stipler went to Reb Chaim's house, which was down the block, where, you know, where, where it's Chaim. So what had happened is earlier in the day, the wife, Reb Chaim's wife, or one of the daughters, had said to the stipler that Reb Chaim's back is hurting him. So the stipler said he should lie down in bed. So he lay down in bed, but the stipler never said to get out of bed, so he just laid in bed until the stipler came, because the stipler said. So the stipler told Reb Chaim that he never take a position. So what's happened? What did he do? He sat and learned. He learned in Kolo, they learned in his house, and he learns, he learns around the clock, and he learns and learns and learns and learns. Look at what the influence has become. You know how many letters Reb Chaim Kineski has answered over the years? They estimate over 100,000 letters that he's, asked, that he's answered over the years. People send him self-addressed envelopes with their questions, and he, he sits there with his son for a few hours every morning writing, writing answers to letters. That's just his letters. You ever tried to go into him? You ever see what goes on when people are trying to go into him? How many people are getting in for brachas from him and advice? And, and the svarim that he's written, you know, kind of svarim he's written, a whole, a whole shelf of svarim he's written. This is, that's the menorah. That's the influence that you share on other people. The Talmud Chacham may have an, he has an obligation. You know who said this vort, by the way? <laughs> His father-in-law, Rebbe Yashiv. And that's what's so enchanting. You know what Rebbe Yashiv's schedule was? Rebbe Yashiv used to go to sleep at 10.30 at night. Because he got up at 2 in the morning. And at 2 in the morning, he would learn in the house until Shachris. And then, during the day, he would go, there was a little sh hovel, a little shul, called Oel Sara in, in, in Meisharim, and he would go in and he would lock himself in this base, in this little shul, and he would learn alone. He also learned alone. He tried learning a kola, he learned a kola for about two weeks with the group, it wasn't for him. He went into the base medrash and he learned alone. And he was learning alone for about, oh, about 70, 80 years there was a stretch when he was also a, a die and he was a judge on the Jerusalem High Court, but then he stopped with that. And he just sat and learned alone. Then he had an hour or two where they were answered all of his questions. People, and the rest of the time he learned. He learned early in the morning. He learned. Uh, they even knocked at his door once. Two, two Kolo guys once knocked at his door late. It was about 10.35 at night. They came to ask a Shiloh, an important Shiloh. So says, the Rebbitson answered the door. They said, we have Shiloh for the road. She said, he went to sleep. So they're at 10.30 at night. 10.30 at night, went to sleep. He goes, well, he gets up at 2 in the morning. So they said, why does he do that? He said, well, he has, to, he has to know how to answer your questions. So he sat there learning in this level. Now, there was a guy who grew up in May, the guy in Mayasharim, who moved to America. And he came back about 70 years later. He said, you know, I remember there was a boy, there was a young man, there was a teenager, who used to close himself off in the shul over there and used to learn. Whatever happened to him? They said, come with me, right? They went back to this little hovel to show. They said, here, go look inside. That's him. Same guy, same Revel Yashiv. The same Revel Yashiv who was the one who sat by himself. He was the Aron Kodesh, isolated by himself. And then he became the biggest posek in the Jewish people. The, he was the one who exerted the influence on the Jewish people. That's what Revel Yashiv says. Those are the two things. They had a Tavon Chacham as a Torah scholar. 
each person at his level is then going to influence his community. Sometimes, you know, when you learn in yeshiva, then you have to also, you have to learn with chavrusas, you have to learn with weaker guys, you have to go out to your community. Each person, when the time is right. But there are going to be two aspects of each Torah scholar. Number one. Number two. Number three. I forgot what number we're on. Okay. Number two. Four, six, eight, twelve, whatever number we're on. Why is the Aron Kodesh wood? And what does the gold represent? Why is the Aron Kodesh wood? What do you say, Tzvi? Uh, good, good, good. Wood is humble, humbler than, the wood is certainly humbler than gold. Good. What else? Uh, trees can grow, but Correct. gold is stuck. Correct. Cre- trees are alive. It's growth. A Torah scholar has to grow. The Aron Kodesh is growth. Gold doesn't grow. Certainly not in my pocket so far. But gold does not grow. Right? It's never too late, by the way. Gold does not gold does not grow. You in there? Gold doesn't grow. Wood grows. And a Torah scholar always has to grow. The gold on the inside and the gold on the outside represents that we have to perfect there are two aspects here. We have to perfect ourselves on the inside. We have to perfect ourselves on the outside. That means it's not enough to be a good person on the outside. We have to be tocho kibaro. We have to be honest with ourselves. Not just, don't, don't show yourself one way and on the inside is something else. We have to be gold on the inside and gold on the outside. That's why I'm always weary of people who wear their Yiddishkeit on their sleeves. A guy says to me, a guy's da- da- Davids and he shuckles, you know, the guy's, guy's like, you know, it looks like he's, mm-hmm. sometimes they see the guys are shaking their fist at HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know, I know exactly, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, so a guy looks like he's going to hurt himself, he's going to sprain his neck while he's davening Shimon Esri, a guy was working around with a neck brace, what happened? Oh, I davened Mincha, you know, <laughs> you know, it's not supposed to happen. So, so I'm always wary of this. How do you know when you should, if, what's my standard for, should I, should I make the gesture? If you're davening alone in your room, would you do the same thing? If you're davening alone, would you be, would you be davening like that or would you davening alone look a little different? If that's how it looks in your room, so that's how it should look at the base of Don't, don't, don't put on a show for anybody. No performances. No performances. Go save for performances for Broadway. Right? You make more money that way too. If a person, the, the, anytime a person makes, a, sometimes I see guys over here making an Asher Yatsar, it looks like, looks like the Elon Yom Kippur, the way they make their Asher Yatsar over there. You know, you know don't, don't, yeah, did your Rebbeim do that? Have you ever seen any of the rabbis do that, stand there against the mm, Asher Yatsar? They daven so long they have to go to the bathroom again by the time they finish. Yeah, yeah, it's not, they, they, they don't know where you just got on your sleeve. Right? Yeah, don't, 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 don't yeah, just be whoever you are on the inside, that's who you should be on the outside. Wherever you are, I told you there were yeshivas in America, the yeshivas in America, Baltimore yeshiva, Tells yeshiva, Mir yeshiva, they didn't allow the single student, the, the, the unmarried guys to even grow beards. They didn't let them grow beards. Because let your, let your, let your Torah scholarship do the talking. And then the beard, then there's all the, the, you know, the beard and the hat and the payas and the dog. They, oh, no, no, when I see guys, when I see Bali Chuva sprouting payas, that's not a good sign. And all of a sudden they say, that's a, that's a phantom, you know, that was quick, from zero to 60. And yet all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's become, what do you call it? He's, he's thrown stones within two weeks of having come from. They, 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 you know, wait, wait, let's give yourself some time. Now give yourself some time. So it should be inside and outside should be the same. You should be the same person on the inside as you are on the outside, number one. Number two, and this is a little tougher, you should be the same person in your inner life, in your home, as you are outside the home. Rav Hirsch says you should be golden in your inner life and golden on your outer life. And believe me, that's tough. It's much easier to be nice to the people at the office than your own family. Right? Because when you're nearest and dearest, they know you. You're not trying to impress them. In the office, everybody's on their best. Oh, he's such a nice man. You know, everybody has, outside the home, there's a little bit more prestige. If you're nice, you help a little old lady carry her, carry her bags. She and you can think that you're exotic. Right? Until you come home, right? Carrie, doing the dishes for your wife, though nobody notices that. Right? That that nobody notices. Reverse says you got to be golden on the inside, and you got to be golden on the outside. And the hardest relationship you'll ever be involved in is your family relationships. That's always the toughest. And therefore, a person who is really absorbing Torah should be on the inside, your inner life, and your and your outer life. 
That's why you have people who, who all their emphasis is always on being nice to everybody else. At home, they're absolute monsters. At home, they're absolute monsters. And, and, and as the old saying goes, there are only two who know what your true level are, is. One is the Rebona Shalom, and the other one is your wife. They're the only ones who know your true level. Everybody else, everybody else you can deceive. Your wife you can't deceive. That's the, that's, that's the rule. That's the two. Okay? Now, what do you have? Take a look at Pastor Yud, Yud Aleph. Vitsi Pisa Oso Zer, on 446, fourth line. Vitsi Pisa Oso Zohov Tor, you should coat it with gold, which I told you are boxes. Mi bias from the inside, an allusion to your home. Umi chutz, and from the outside, titzapenu, you should coat it. Ve'asisa olov zer zahav saviv. You should make a crown, a golden crown around it. Well, what do you think that golden crown means? Obviously, the crowning achievement, the person who learns Torah long enough, you become a person of, uh, you grow a crown. A crown means that, that people see that you are a person who has worked on yourself. You're a different person. Each person at his level, a person who learns Torah, changes as a result of Torah. And therefore, you make the crown. Now, the Mishnah in Pirkei says there are three crowns. What are the three crowns? There's the crown of Torah. There's the crown of Kahuna. The crown of Malchus. Right? There are three crowns that are available to us. The crown of Torah scholarship, the crown of being a Kohen, and the crown of being a king. Now, a king and a Kohen, you know, that's predetermined. If you come from the Davidic line, you could be a king, possibly. If you don't come from the Davidic line, that's not part of your, that's not going to happen. Any of you are Kohanim? Any of you Levium? You're a levy. Okay, you can't be a king. All right? Now, anybody else? You got the opportunity. There's a last crown, which is the crown of Torah. The crown of Torah, the way the Gemara puts it, it's sitting in the corner. Anybody, it's available for anybody. There's nobody who's got dibs on the crown of Torah. Anybody could go and get the crown of Torah. And the ultimate crown, which is the crown that, that is worn, it goes on top of them, the Mishnah says, Keser Shem Tov, a good name, Keser Shem, the crown of a good name, rides on them. The crown of Torah, Zer Zahav, so there's a golden crown, it's available to everybody. Now, look at the next passage. V'yatsakta lo arba taba o zahav. make four rings of gold. What do these rings represent? Four rings, where they're going to put the, if you look in the picture, it looks like Q-tips. Hey, look at the Q-tips, or those are the poles that carry the Aron Kodesh. It looks like Q-tips, right? Okay, those are the poles. They have a little bulb at the end. So it says you're going to make four rings, back in the Pasuk, V'yatsakta lo arba tabozov, v'nasata al arba pa'amosov, you put it on the four corners, u'shtei taboz al tzaloha echos, u'shtei taboz al tzaloha shenis. You put two rings on one side and two rings on the other side. What are the golden rings on the corner of the Aron Kodesh, the golden rings, what's the difference, what's, what, what's unique about a circle? No what's that? There's no unique sides. There's no unique sides, plus, it's never ending. That represents the never ending reward for anybody who studies Torah. When you study Torah, there's never ending reward. I remember walking into a store once in America, like a, they went into the book section. And they had like children's books. So if you look at Torah children's books, there's like the children's book about doing chesed and the children's book about not speaking Lush and Hara. And my kids have all these children's books about, you know, Har Sinai, you know, what do you call that? There's a, so I was looking at this is just like a general children's book. I remember there's a book about circles. And the name of the book was I Love Circles. I remember thinking, you love circles? There's got to be love in there. What do you love about circles? And I personally didn't like circles. I saw them on the top of my test paper all the time in high school. <laughs> I certainly didn't like circles. The only circles I do love are the ones after a number on my check. You know, the more circles, the better. What's circle? What do you love about circles? Say, oh, I love circles. Here are circles that we love. The circles on the corner of the Aron Kodesh, those are the circles because that is a reminder of the never-ending reward for Torah, and the reward for Torah exceeds all other rewards.
Okay, we'll continue tomorrow. Call it I Love Sir.